Okay, Screencast is going to focus on empirical formulas and um, some basic stoichiometric limiting reactants, percent yields. So let's talk about empirical formulas first. You should be familiar with the definition of an empirical formula. All right, let's quickly define that. This is going to be the um, smallest, it's a chemical formula that has the smallest whole number ratio of elements. The ratio of elements. For example, if I have a molecule that um, was C3H6, uh, which actually can't exist, so let me make it C4H6. Okay, so C4H6. Um, the this would be a molecular formula. The empirical formula would be C2H3. Okay, so the empirical formula gives you the smallest whole number ratio. A molecular formula, spell the right molecular, oh, wow, molecular formula, okay, tells you the number and specific elements in that formula. Okay, so how do we calculate empirical formula from, and probably should note this, this is going to be from experimental data. Okay. First thing that we're going to be given from an experiment is we're going to give be given the mass percent of each element in the compound. First step, you're going to assume that there's 100 grams of the sample. You're going to find grams of each element. You're going to use the molar mass to calculate the moles of each element. You're going to calculate that simplest mole ratio and then convert that into an empirical formula. Okay. This information here, percent mass of each element, is known as the percent composition. And you will be asked to calculate percent compositions for different compounds as well. And it basically is finding the mass percent of each element present in that compound. Okay, so if we look at an example, uh, looking at paraamniobenzoic acid, you'll see that listed as PABA on your bottle of sunscreen. Um, information that we're given is that it has carbon at 61.31%, hydrogen at 5.14%, nitrogen, and oxygen, and it gives us those mass percents. So the first thing that we would do is we're going to assume that we have 100 grams of this compound. Each percentage just goes directly into grams then. Using the molar mass, you're going to be calculating the moles of each element. From there, you're going to identify which is the smallest number of moles. You're going to use that smallest number of moles to calculate the mole ratio. So basically, and when I do this, I am careful to do moles. Um, I write this step out. Okay. So you calculate the moles of carbon divided by the smallest number of moles of whatever element it happens to be, and you'll come up with the simplest whole number ratio. Now be aware, if when you calculate these numbers, you end up with, say, 1.5 or something 0.5, you cannot round this. You have to multiply everything by 2 so that your 1.5 would go to 3 moles of whatever element it is. All right? But you have to multiply everything that you've calculated to get these to be whole numbers. Similarly, if you end up with something 0.33 or something 0.67, you're going to multiply those by 3 to make them a whole number. Um, 0.25 multiplied by 4, and so on. Okay? All right. So the empirical formula for that example would be C7H7NO2. Okay, and here is a model for that molecule with seven carbons, seven hydrogens, there's one probably hiding over here, one nitrogen, and two oxygens. 
a kind of a twist on finding empirical formulas looking at combustion analysis right and there's just a little bit of a difference if you remember combustion is going to be the reaction of something say I have a compound CX H7 I'm sorry eight wow H Y O Z if I'm going to combust it I'm going to react it with oxygen and I'm going to form water and carbon dioxide hopefully you can see that the carbon in the reactants comes straight from the carbon that's in the original compound and the same can be said about the hydrogen the only problem is that this oxygen that's in both the water and the CO2 either comes from the oxygen in the compound or the oxygen in the air that it reacts with so you have to approach these um, these calculations a little bit differently All right, you're going to uh, the analysis will typically give you the amount of water and the amount of carbon dioxide and the mass of the original sample you can determine the moles of carbon from the mass of CO2 produced you can, can calculate the moles of hydrogen from the mass of water produced the moles of oxygen is going to be determined by taking the difference between the original compound okay so to be the original compound and that of course would be the mass of the original compound minus the mass of the carbon and the mass of the hydrogen this is going to give you the mass of oxygen. From there you can determine the moles of oxygen and then you follow the same process to get the simplest whole number ratio. Okay. Elemental analysis, um, if your compound has elements other than carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen, you would do different chemical processes to determine their mass and eventually come up with their molecular mass. The rest of this should really be review of basic stoichiometry, stoichiometric calculations. You have a balanced chemical reaction. You can relate these things on the basis of molecules you can relate them on the basis of um, mass but we typically don't do that because we almost always do it in moles um, but you can also do it obviously with moles which is typically what we do um, just remember that the coefficients in this balanced chemical equation are in the moles of the reactants and the products Okay, not the mass, it's the moles. Always get to the moles when we're dealing with chemical um, equations and relationships. All right, so stoichiometric calculations. We always deal in mass because that's what we can measure in the lab, but you always want to convert that to moles to do any kind of calculations. There's probably an exception, but they're very few. Um, but that's how you're going to relate one compound to another in a balanced chemical relationship, be it a reactant to another reactant or a reactant to a product or a product to a product. Okay. This confuses me, so I'm just going to go through it. Limiting reactants. I'll put this uh, PowerPoint up um, if you have trouble with limiting reactants, you need to come talk to me. If you have trouble with the idea of excess reactant, come and see me. So I'm going I'm to go very quickly through these. When you're making cookies or you're making sandwiches, you can make enough cookies as long as you have enough of all of the ingredients. The ingredient that runs out first is what limits the number of cookies. That's going to be known as your limiting reactant. Okay, if you look at a particle diagram, and by the way, particle diagrams are really important for you to understand and be able to draw, okay, because you've got to visualize what's in the reaction, what's in the solution. If you can do that, uh, chemistry becomes just a little bit easier.
All right. If you can't do it, I'm at a loss sometimes on how to explain things. All right. So we're looking at the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen here, making water. You can see I have 10 hydrogen molecules and I have seven oxygen molecules. You can see in this bef after the reaction that I've been able to make 10 water molecules and in doing so I have seven or I'm, I have two oxygen molecules left over. So obviously my hydrogen was the limiting reactant because it's all used up to make the products. I did not need all of the oxygen that was given so I have some of those in excess. You are expected to be able to calculate what the excess reactant mass would be um, or concentration or anything like that. Theoretical yield. Theoretical yield is the maximum amount of product that can be made. Okay, It's the amount of product possible as calculated through a stoichiometric problem. If there is a limiting reactant and you identify those problems usually as the one that gives you information on both reactants, the theoretical yield is going to be the amount that you can make assuming the limiting reactant is entirely used up. You do not calculate the theoretical yield based on the excess reactant because you don't have enough of the limiting. Okay, so theoretically you can only make all of that. The actual yield is the the amount that one actually produces and measured and this is usually the one that has to be given given or experimentally determined. Okay, that says experimentally determined. So the actual yield has to be part of the problem or it's going to be what you determine in the lab. Okay, percent yield. Please remember this equation. It is not the same as percent error. It's related, but not the same. Percent yield is the actual yield over the theoretical yield. This is usually, usually, less than 100% because you're going to incur losses in the experiment, experimental process. Okay. Some loss through the filter paper, um, some doesn't go, some doesn't fully precipitate out, um, you may have lost some on the edges of the Erlenmeyer. There's a bunch of places where you could use yield. So that serves as the review of stoichiometry and some calculations.